Hey, welcome to Video Bytes. I'm Ethan, and with me is Scott Rylinson of NetOrca. NetOrca is an orchestration tool, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna demo this thing today, aren't we, Scott? We're gonna show you how to both offer and consume services via NetOrca and manage them through their life cycle. Now, one of the things I think we should do before we get into the demo is uh, is your terms, Scott, your definitions, uh, because you've got a bunch of definitions that I think would just be helpful to set some context. Yeah, and I hope these align to things that people normally deal with with these type of products. Basically, there's two views of NetOrca. There's a service owner team. They offer the services. There's a consumer team that consumes those services. So I think service owner is an infrastructure team. Consumer is a developer team, and they want a load balancer, for example. Now, the service is the actual service that's being offered. An owner can offer many services, um, load balancer or a secure load balancer or whatever. The service schema is what defines that service onto the platform, and we'll show this, but it's a JSON schema. It shows required fields and the validations for each of them. A service item is an instance of a service. So you've got LB1 as an instance of load balancer service. And a change instance is what manages state. It's any detected difference between uh, what the customer has already and wants, basically. And then we've just got applications that are collections of service item and a submission, which is an individual push uh, to update NetOrc with what the customer wants. Okay. So walk us through what the demo is going to show us, Scott. So basically, we'll go through sort of those three phases. First, we'll show you briefly how a service owner would define and offer a service onto NetOrca and do that via Git repository. Then we'll show you how consumers would submit and consume services via the Git repos. And then finally, we'll show you how the service owner would then take those submission or those uh, change instances and submissions and actually push them onto a device. And in this case, we'll actually deploy a load balancer onto an F5. And just so we're clear here, we're using the load balancing thing. That's our demo, but we could be doing any number of network services with NetOrca. So it's designed to be as flexible as possible, and it's really down to what service you define um, as to what you're offering to the consumer. We'll show that actually. First view we have of NetOrca is from that service owner perspective, and we can see that the service owner has a number of services that they offer. So in this case, we've got various uh, load balancers. But as you mentioned, this could be anything. This could be something even as simple as a C name or an A record to something super complex like a you know extensive, super secure network pattern that has multiple things it needs to configure. But that all, all that definition starts with the service owner Git repository. So in this case for the load balancer team, we've got a Git repository here and all this is, is a template. So a new service owner would just fork or copy this repo. They have a .NET Orca folder, and then they just need to put the work into creating a JSON schema which defines the service. And what I mean by defines is it tells users well, what fields they need to put in and how those fields need to be structured. So in this case, for the load balancer, we're asking for two things, the name and the target IPs. Uh, the names we can see has a, a pattern match that requires the users to put dash dev, dash UAT, whatever on the end of it. And the target IPs, um, very simple example, but just ask for a list of IPv4 addresses. And they have to be IPv4 addresses. Because you've got a regex in that pattern that is going to make me, it's, that's what's going to require it so it'll validate. Yeah, exactly. And the, the reason for managing this in, in Git is it then allows you to update that schema throughout the lifecycle. So a quick demo of that. I've created a change to the repo here. And, you know, let's say this service owner decided that they now want to allow non-prod requests. So they could then update the schema six months down offering the service. And that's all they need to do, update the merge request in the Git repo. And then if this one was merged, it would be onto NetOrca and reflected in the schema here and then applied for any new services that are requested against it. So to show you how the services are requested, we'll flip teams and we'll move to the consumer team. So the consumer teams themselves are just on the view that shows all their existing services. But the main starting point they'd have in NetOrca is to go to the service catalog. And the service catalog is designed to be, okay, what services can I consume via NetOrca? And this is dynamically generated from all these service owner teams, you know, pushing those services via that Git process. Once it's offered, it's ready for any consumers to use, basically. 
So in this case, we're a consumer, you know, we want to request a load balancer service. So in this view, we get a readme, which is also uh, sent in via that Git repository. It'll tell us what we're, we're requesting. We can have a look at that schema if we really want to get into the nuts and bolts of it, make sure that things are okay. And we can get an example of what we actually need to put in our Git repository to request that. Another segue in that the consumers in this design should have a Git repository as well. So if we go to the consumer Git repository, it's basically another slightly different but similar template. So let's say I'm the alpha team, I'm a development team, I want to release an app, so I'm interested in that load balance service. To get set up on NetOrca, I just need access to the GUI, and then I need to fork or clone a repository um, into my project. So let's say, you know, with all my other code, I have one infrastructure repo, and I would clone this, and all I need to then do is set up an API key. And once that's set up, I'm away, I'm ready to request from uh, NetOrca. This GitLab CI file is a templated thing, I think you mentioned before the call that you use GitHub. In, in GitHub, it would be exactly the same. We could provide templates for that. Yeah, this looks familiar. Just right. I'm more used to the GitHub GitHub versus GitLab UI. Same same thing, different view. So basically, within this repository, the consumers have a .NET Orca folder, and then we mentioned the concept of applications as the logical sort of buckets of service items that they request. Here's an existing application has a lot of existing requests. And we've also got app two, which just has the one load balance. So what we want to do is we've got a LB2, we want LB3. So we're going to create a, a request to do that. Now, I've pre-prepared this, but it's the simple case is all you need to do is modify your configuration. And the way to do that is to edit that file, uh, create a new instance in the YAML file. So we've got alpha LB3 and put in your details. And then we recommend that customers or consumers do this via a merge request process. And so this is now, I've made those changes and I've put in a merge request. And the main thing that you get from the merge request process, is it has a validation. That CI, CD pipeline has a validation process. What that does is send your changes to NetOrca and make sure that all your changes meets that schema. It's not just for one change, you could do a hundred changes here and they all would get validated. And to show you what, it looks like if you have a validation error, uh, this is one I did before. If we look at my change, the obvious error is I've got too many digits in the last doctor IPv4, and we saw that regex earlier. So if I look at the validation log, so that's just my standard GitLab CI CD process, I can then see that in app to load balancer LB3, you know, I've got an IP address error. And the main point of this is to get customers to capture those errors before they've even put a request through. So the load balancer team hasn't even seen this request and the, the consumers are seeing that they've got an error, seeing that it's not going to work and they could fix it straight away. Other than I'm sure we've all seen when you put a request in, it takes two hours to come back and say, hey, you made a mistake and you've just wasted two hours. With this consumer team, they would go through this process, they'd wait for validation. Let's say the senior engineer comes in and checks that they actually need a load balance and then they'd merge it to their master repository or main repository. So now that it's merged onto main, the same CI pipeline kicks off, but now we're doing a submission. So we'll look on our consumer view for NetOrca. So I'm logged in as a consumer now. So yeah, I can see that I've got all these existing services, builds coming through and here I go. I see I've got NetOrc has detected that I'm requesting a new service, the LB3 UAT. And I can see in this change instance that I've, what my diff is, obviously, because it's a new thing, it's diffing from nothing. And so as a consumer, I see this, and it importantly, it comes into the pending state. Now, pending, we have two states, well, three states, pending, approved, and completed. Um, this could be rejected here, but mainly the main point of this pending state is to have a secondary level of validation. So if we go back to the LB team, the LB team sees these change instances pop up and they would see the change instances from all the teams that are consuming their services, not just the alpha team. They've decided to make that go uh, pending first and they would have a validation process. So in our example, 
what we do is we just have an AWX play that validates those CIs. So I'll kick that off. I want to make sure that what they asked for, we can actually do, that that's, that's a, a, an appropriate request before I'm going to approve it. Yeah. Yeah. And a good example in this case would be, uh, you know, are those IPs in the right network or do they exist or are they associated with a target? That kind of thing. So something that you can't validate via a simple schema and regex. And I've already, I've got this Ansible play that I've written that I'm kicking off to make sure that that happens and that passes for me. Yeah. And it's it's really to say that, you know, your, your config's right. It's not to say we can't deploy it this time. Um, it's just that it's a second level of validation. And it's optional. You can also choose to just straight approve things if you're really tight on how your service is defined. So this has come through. The Ansible plays uh, validated it. And we're approved. We're good to go. So to prove that I actually do something, we'll first look at the F5. Uh, so I've got this uh, PP tenant. And we've got beta LB1, alpha LB, and alpha LB2. So we know on our new changes, since we're trying to push LB3. So if we go back to our AWX play, and then so basically now I've got a, another AWX play that deploys it. and what this is doing, so it's the service owner, so the LB team would have to create this Ansible play or Terraform or some script, or they could even do it manually. But it essentially gets all the state changes, the change instances from NetOrca, and it also gets the service item definitions. So it gets these declarations and then it converts them and does whatever it needs to do to create that into a config that can be deployed onto an infrastructure device. And this doesn't need to be just one infrastructure device. It could be a whole bunch of things that need to happen. Reserve a C name, do something else. Yeah. So that AWX play is going to go through. It's done now. We can you know, complete, but we see that the LV3 has been created. Um, and now that's up and running. Now, if we look at our consumer view and we do a bit of a refresh on change instances, we see that it's all complete. And importantly, we go to our service item and we see that it's green, green, all the changes are completed. We can log into the service item. We can see which change instances were completed. So now I know the thing I asked for is created. I can go ahead and use it. Yeah, exactly. You know, green, green means that the state you requested has been synced effectively and it's completely deployed. You can go off and use it. Good segue in mentioning state is that creation isn't the only thing that this can support. So it can support changes. Modifications to things, in practice, a lot of the time, a lot of the modifications I see is, oops, I made an error. I didn't mean to put 26 in there. I'll put 27 in there. And I will just, for the sake of speed, I'll just commit this straight to the main branch um, Ooh, your and skip that okay. validation process. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but basically, so yeah, I've made a mistake. I said, oh, 26 should be 27 committed that to main and skip the validation process, but I am risky, but that will go off and build again. And what should happen now is that NetOrca should pick up that from this config, LB3 is an existing service, it's an existing service item, but the customer has changed something about it. So it creates a modifier request. And if we go to our change instances, I have to wait for builds. And while this is running, just these builds as I mentioned, are pretty templated and they're pretty lightweight. All they're doing is taking what's in the customer repo, converting it to JSON and sending it to NetOrca. The CI CD is not doing the has something modified or you know the complicated parts of that. That's done uh, through NetOrca itself. So yeah, that build is kicked off and I can see that modify. So NetOrca is picked up. It's an existing service. There's something changed there. And I'm going to track that via a new change instance. I know it's a modify. And then the owner team, so the LB team, would just, they just go through the exact same process. So again, for the for speed, I will kick off the validate play, which will move it to approved. And then I will go and I will kick off the deploy play, which after that's approved, will go off and deploy it to the F5. So we'll quickly before that deploys, if I can catch it, our pool is LB3. We'll look at the members. 
yeah, so we'll see that the changes come through if I just look at the, so I'm going 26 to 27 there. Yeah, so we'll see that reflected. If we look at our service items, we've seen it's gone green. So that change instance has been completed there. And then if I go to my F5 and I refresh that pool, I'll say 25, 27. So it's updated. The other plot that works with is for deletion. So it's not just modifications. You can delete a service. So if I do my same hack as before and just commit to main, all I need to do is delete that element of the config. And then I can effectively request that that load balancer service gets deleted. And that's where I talk about full lifecycle changes. So it gives the customers a really easy way to delete something. And because it's coming from this source of customer source of truth effectively, which is their Git repo, you know that when they're requesting to delete it, they actually want it deleted. It's not this two years later trying to find who owns the the VIP service <laughs> to get them to delete it. I've never been on that audit team. Anybody know who owns this? No, let's yeah. shut it down and see what happens. <laughs> exactly. So trying to avoid those things. Um, but basically, effectively, it just becomes the same process for all those type of changes. So again, I'm waiting for a build that'll kick off and then I should get a change instance deleted. Yeah. And, you know, my team just goes through the exact same process. They've got a validate play that they run and they run the deploy play. So you can see that on the service side of things, this supporting the lifecycle just becomes a bit of a, uh, you know, just a daily run, basically, you know, daily run of the automation. Whereas NetOrca handles the complexity of has someone changed something? Have they deleted it? Do they actually want it? That kind of thing. It's so much slicker than the bad old days of I got a help desk ticket from uh, somebody on the dev team who needs yet another F5 instance stood up and then you're just grinding it all out by hand. Even if you've got some automation, this is more elegant than that by uh, by a lot. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's the idea. It's facilitating all that good automation that you know teams have done and bringing it right to the customer and, and saying, you know, giving them a really easy and slick way to consume that. So our Ansible plays... Uh, Still running along, and we will refresh. And there's your service deletion, Scott. All right, yeah, got it done. Full life cycle, cradle to grave, got it done. Hopefully, you can see how that expands out to hundreds of consumers and potentially ten service owners. Is is how it could expand out. It's not just a one to one thing. It's it's really designed to help those people who've created automation scale out and properly offer that automation direct to those consumer and developer teams. So Scott, uh, the great demo, uh, really showed off the product well, the whole process and how that works, uh, that, that's really slick. If people want to find out more about NetOrca, where would you send them? Just go to our website, netorca.io, and there's a contact us page. I'm sure there'll be some links in the bottom of this YouTube uh, video as well. And uh, yeah, we'd be happy to demo it. We have demo instances that we can do for your bespoke use cases and run through any questions you may have. Okay, Scott, thanks very much. Thanks, Ethan.